Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jonathan Newman. Uh, my topic today is business cycles. And I really like the way uh, this boot camp has been structured. Uh, I'll be relying on a lot of the things that you've learned in the other lectures. In fact, I, as I was listening to the lectures, I was thinking, yes, I'm glad they, they talked about that. That's one less thing that I have to cover here with this large topic of uh, business cycles. But human action, fundamentally, subjective value, prices, uh, entrepreneurs and production, intervention, money, all have uh, a role to play in telling the Austrian theory of the business cycle. So a lot of presentations like to start off with um, a definition. I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to say what a business cycle is not. <clears throat> Uh, business cycles are not just regular business fluctuations. So the changes in uh, data and prices and preferences that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. So changes happen all the time. And as you uh, heard and hopefully learned in the entrepreneurship or uh, entrepreneur uh, lecture, uh, this is a task for the entrepreneurs to uh, handle and to anticipate and to guess and, and deal with these sorts of changes. So anytime something is produced, changes occur. Anytime something is consumed, changes occur. Preferences can change all the time. And in producing and consuming things, we, uh, we build up and decrease our supply of resources. So these sorts of changes are we would not uh, call a business cycle or, or something that would relate to business cycles uh, explicitly. Uh, but just to uh, make a few notes here, uh, if entrepreneurs are guessing these changes correctly, if they're making good choices, profitable choices, uh, then we can say that the economy is growing, that the entrepreneur is taking uh, resources that are less valuable to consumers and transforming them into resources that are more highly valued to consumers. So an economy would be growing in that sense. If entrepreneurs are receiving losses, then we can say that <coughs> the resources that they are using were, were more highly valued uh, to consumers than the uh, actual output of their production process. And so the economy would be in decline or wealth is being destroyed if we see uh, losses. <clears throat> and the market has a great way of dealing with this sort of thing. Entrepreneurs who correctly guess consumer uh, desires, consumer demands receive profits and losses for the opposite. So uh, what is a, gener uh, a, a business cycle? Uh, it's a general boom followed by a general bust. And so we see uh, these sort of uh, patterns in economic data. And of course, all of uh, the data that I'm about to show you come with uh, the caveats of the way that they're measured and, and how they are appropriately used. <clears throat> but just, uh, just to get a good picture here, don't worry about uh, reading the axes here. I just want you to see the general shape of the data. So this is uh, re real GDP, uh, so output over time. And this is uh, from 2000-ish to 2012. And you see that there's a general rise and then a general fall in the recession period. <clears throat> Here's uh, the unemployment rate, which actually has the opposite sort of shape. So you might wonder why I put it up there. Well, if you, if you do 100 minus the unemployment rate, then you get the same sort of shape here. It's a rise and then a fall. And other uh, economic data has the same sort of pattern. So stock price indices like the uh, Dow Jones and uh, NASDAQ uh, indices, stock prices follow the same sort of trend. And also recently we saw uh, the same sort of trend with uh, housing prices. So this is a house price uh, index. We see a general rise and then a general fall. And so this is this is the uh, the purview of uh, business cycles. This is what we have set out to explain. And I, <clears throat> I'm in a mainstream program over at uh, Auburn, and so I wanted to do as much data collection as I possibly could to see. Uh, <clears throat> what might be relevant here when we're talking about business cycles. And I stumbled upon this uh, site called Spurious Correlations, and I found that uh, the number of films that Nicolas Cage stars in actually follows the same sort of trend. We had this uh, increase and decrease, so we might need to take this into account if we're good mainstream economists. We should incorporate this into our theory. The name of the site was Spurious Correlations, and so they actually correlated this with the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool. So let this be a public service announcement. If you see... Nicholas Cage films uh, start to, to more Nicholas Cage films start to pop up. Uh, expect a market crash and stay away from swimming pools. <laughs> Another phenomenon that we see uh, in business cycles is that uh, consumer prices uh, vary less than factor prices. So the the inputs that go <clears throat> into production vary more than the, the price of the outputs of production. And so just to put some data on the screen for that, we see CPI is this nice, uh, or it's more smooth than the producer price index, uh, which has much more variation here. And especially uh, uh, in the most recent recession, there was this big fall here, much bigger than the fall in consumer prices. Great. Again, with the caveats for uh, the way that these things are measured. <clears throat> 
So we have to uh, account for a few different things. When we are constructing a business cycle theory, we have to account for the shapes. We have this general boom and then a general bust. Uh, we have to account for a cluster of entrepreneurial errors. So we see in business cycles, all of a sudden entrepreneurs start making all of these errors where uh, we see in, in regular times, entrepreneurs are very good at, uh, or, or should be good at anticipating changes and, and the ones that do a good job are, are rewarded with profits. The ones that do a bad job are punished with losses. And so what happens in a business cycle that makes all of this sort of break down and we have this big cluster of errors by entrepreneurs? And also, uh, our theory should explain this uh, difference in the variability or the variation in consumer prices and producer prices, or the prices of consumer goods and the prices of uh, the factors of production. And so uh, <clears throat> we can have uh, a few suspect areas here. Uh, since it's something that happens to the economy as a whole or the macro economy, uh, we might look to money as an area where something funny might be happening, something that's causing uh, these uh, phenomena. Also, credit pervades the uh, economy, and so here I'd be relying on uh, Malavika's uh, previous lecture. <clears throat> and also, I mean, you saw the data. We can't uh, we can't rule out Nick Cage as a possible causal factor here. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to give away the punchline here. Uh, the Austrian theory of the business cycle uh, really hinges around this idea of malinvestment, and malinvestment is investment in unprofitable lines of production induced by artificially low interest rates. So it's <clears throat> unprofitable lines of production because, or they invested in these lines of production because of the uh, artificially low interest rates. <clears throat> so we have to explain how uh, interest rates influence production, or at least how they're related. Uh, we also have to uh, have a good picture of production and the way uh, um, profits are anticipated ex ante, so before uh, the good is actually sold at the end of the production process, and it's the profits or losses are actually realized ex post. So we don't really realize that things were malinvestments uh, uh, truly until after the production process. I mean, some of us, uh, even among uh, this crowd, might have a, a good eye for uh, p picking out what might be a malinvestment. <clears throat> and malinvestment is a, a good uh, candidate uh, because it explains the boom, so there's increased investment, and we'll see that there's also increased uh, consumption that goes along with an artificial credit expansion. It explains the bust, so all of these malinvestments have to be liquidated, which would explain all the, the, the downward trend in all the data uh, after the, uh, the crisis, uh, once the, uh, the bust phase is set in. It also explains the cluster of errors. It's related to money and credit, as we'll see, and it's also related to capital markets. And the reason for this is, or the reason we know this is because uh, a lot of the funds uh, that are borrowed in credit markets are borrowed by firms, the ones that do the, the producing. And so you see this graph here. Uh, during times of credit expansion, in this area here, we did see a, a big increase in the number of commercial and industrial loans. <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, start to get a, a a good picture of the structure of production or Austrian uh, theory of production so that we can better talk about how it's related to the interest rate and time preference. Time preference has been a hot topic today, and so I have the, the joy of explaining it. Uh, the Austrian theory of production is that it exists uh, in a structure, it exists across time. Uh, entrepreneurs combine factors of production, and they, some of them are complements, some of them are substitutes, some of them can be used together to produce things, some, some things are interchangeable in production. Either way, it's a very complex structure. Uh, it's very interwoven, there's a lot of uh, network. Uh, Murray Rothbard used the term, uh, the, the structure of production is a, is a lattice work, so it's a very complicated big network of capital, laborers, laborers and um, land working together under the direction of entrepreneurs guessing uh, consumer demand. And also there's this critical feature in Austrian theory uh, that the production takes time. So what does the structure of production look like? It's been drawn a few different ways. Bombavrik had these concentric uh, circles where on the inside we had uh, entrepreneurs investing in factors of production. And so finally they, they ripen to consumable output in the outside uh, part of the circle. So if you invest more on the inside, then you have a larger circle on the outside. <coughs> Hayek had this strange thing that nobody understands, but luckily he gave us a more simple uh, picture of the structure of production um, where time is moving down. And so uh, an in investment or spending in the different stages of production is measured horizontally until we uh, get consumer 
goods at the, at the bottom of the production process. So this is one uh, structure production, and this is another structure production. One takes more time than the other. <clears throat> Rothbard Bard Hayek's uh, style here, and we have the same sort of thing. You'll notice that there's sort of a triangular shape here, and so in modern applications, we've just sort of retained the essential shape of it, of a triangle, and, and use that <coughs> instead. And Roger Garrison is credited with the uh, development of turning it on its side so that our Western minds can see time moving from left to right, and consumer spending is on, on, the, on, on the side. But it really is all uh, saying the same sort of thing. Production exists in time, uh, capital labors are used in each stage, and at the end of the production process, we have consumable output. <clears throat> okay, so hold that in, in your mind for a second, production and the structure of production. Now I'm gonna talk about uh, the interest rate and time preference. <clears throat> the law of time preference says that we all prefer a given satisfaction sooner rather than later. Uh, we don't really have time to like defend praxeologically where this comes from. There's still a lot of debate uh, today, but, but hopefully you can take my word for it. We like to have things sooner rather than later. Uh, but even though we all have this uh, sort of universal uh, fact about us that we prefer present satisfaction to future satisfaction, we do have a variety of rates of time preference. And this is where exchanging present goods for future goods can arise. Whenever there's a variety of preferences, whenever there's a, a difference in the way we value things, then we can trade to make each other better off. So here's a preference ranking. I don't think one has been represented today, so let me uh, talk through this really quick. Here's David's preference ranking, and here's Jeff's preference ranking here. <clears throat> the way I have it set up is that David prefers $1,200 in the future to $1,000 in the present, and that is preferred to $1,100 in the future. And so you might wonder, where does time preference come into, into play here? Well, we see that $1,000 in the future is ranked below all of these, and is particularly uh, $1,000 in the present. So that we can see that the law of time preference is at work here, because the present uh, $1,000 is preferred to the future $1,000. Jeff has a different rate of time preference. He has a lower rate of time preference. He's more willing to part with this $1,000 in the present. <clears throat> so his uh, highest ranked end or, or his highest ranking has $1,100 in the future and then below that $1,000 in the present, $1,050 in the future, and then we also see that he prefers the $1,000 in the present to $1,000 in the future. So this is where we can, we can see how people have different rates of uh, time preference. And so you see there's an opportunity for them to trade and make each other better off. Jeff values uh, $1,100 in the future over $1,000 in the present. David uh, would rather have the $1,000 in the present than $1,100 in the future, so they can trade the $1,000 today in exchange for the promise that David will pay him the principal plus $100 extra in the future. So they can trade at an interest rate of 10% <clears throat> for whatever the period of the loan is, and, and both are satisfying a more highly ranked end. So this is just one transaction between David and Jeff uh, but if we have multiple people and we bring in more preferences uh, for the future and the present, then we can construct a market for loanable funds. So we, have, we can have a, uh, excuse me, a demand curve and a supply curve <clears throat> based on people's willingness to part with present amounts of money. The price in this market would be the interest rate, just like the, the price here was $100 extra or 10%, and the quantity would be the number of loans transacted. So this is where interest, or this is where one form of interest arises. You'll, you'll notice that this sort of thinking also applies to uh, production. So we part with uh, money today, if we're going to produce something, we part with money today to buy factors of production, only to realize uh, returns for that expenditure later on. And so the same rate of time preference applies here as it, uh, as it does in this sort of transaction. <coughs> And so this is where we pull them together. Since production takes time, the cost of production, so purchasing factors of production, renting capital, uh, or renting a plot of land to build a factory, and hiring laborers, all of those expenditures on cost of production precede revenues uh, from the sale of output. So uh, anticipated future profits are compared to returns that could be uh, earned by lending at interest. Every individual is comparing the returns that they could uh, make by engaging in different actions. So I can lend my money at interest, or I can produce something and get a, a, another rate of return. 
through production and selling my output to consumers. So <clears throat> I have this example here that hopefully will clear things up. Suppose Nick, I don't know where I came up with that name, could earn 5% interest by lending, uh, but has an idea for a product he thinks he could produce and sell for a 7% return. So he has to make this choice. Am I going to dedicate resources uh, by lending at interest? Do I just loan this money that I have at, at interest to somebody else? Or do I engage in production and earn this 7% return? So obviously he chooses the, the area where he, he thinks that he has the higher return. He chooses to produce something at what he anticipates to be 7% uh, return. <clears throat> and in so doing, he's increased his demand for factors and he engages in production um, and puts his product on the market. No matter the outcome of this, if consumers liked the output or didn't like the output, either way, because the interest rate was lower than his anticipated rate of return, he's increased his demand for factors and thereby bid up the cost of production. So the price of the factors give way to the, the cost of production. And so by increasing his demand for factors, he increases the prices, maybe just negligibly, but you can imagine how this can be applied to uh, the whole economy. And so the factors of production uh, get bid up in price, and therefore the, the cost of production get bid up in price. <clears throat> so there's an uh, equalizing tendency here. So the rate of return by lending and the rate of return in production will tend to equal each other over time uh, because of this phenomenon. Imagine the opposite happening. What if there was a 7% return uh, uh, to be earned by lending at interest and a 5% return to be earned by uh, producing something? In this case, he would pull out of production, pull resources away from production, pull demand for factors away from production, and move towards supplying funds for lending, which would push up the interest rate and decrease the um, the price of factors, thereby increasing the returns to be made in production. <laughs> Suffice to say, there is an uh, equalizing tendency in the interest rate in lending and the rate of return to be earned in production. All else held equal. All right, so let's walk through a scenario where uh, people's time preferences decrease. And so this, is, this would be the Austrian theory of an economy growing. <clears throat> At a lower rate of time preference, we decide that we value future production more relative to the present. So we start to devote more resources to, for future satisfactions compared to the present. <clears throat> and so when that happens, uh, we save. The action that is a corollary of that is, is saving. We dedicate resources today for uh, future satisfactions. Uh, and the only way to increase savings is to decrease consumption. Right, so those are mutually exclusive. By increasing savings, that means we have to decrease the amount that we consume. <clears throat> Fewer resources are consumed in the present. The supply of loanable funds increases. So now at all of those existing interest rates, the supply is greater. People will supply uh, more money to be lent in the present in exchange for the promise of future returns. The interest rate falls, and here's a, a critical point here. Uh, production is restructured for longer lines of production. So now uh, longer lines of production have been become profitable at this lower interest rate. It's easier to, uh, uh, to buy factors of production. It's easier to borrow and then buy factors of production for longer, more productive uh, lines of production. We'll talk about this more in just a moment. Also, factor price relationships change as earlier stages see a greater increase in demand than later stages. In fact, late stage factor demand will decrease because as people are decreasing their consumption at the retail end of the structure of production where people are putting stock on shelves, there's less demand for those sorts of workers, less demand for cash registers, less demand for the, 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 on the retail end of the structure of production. <clears throat> so what that would look like with this uh, uh, triangle that we have here is that it would get shorter since consumption spending is decreasing, but it would get longer because there's more investment going on. There's a diversion, a reallocation of resources away from consumption and late stages of production and towards uh, the earlier stages of production. And so I have a sort of a rudimentary way of doing this. Watch closely. It gets shorter and longer at the same time. So this is what happens to the structure of production when we save. <clears throat> The result is that we have uh, greater production in the long run. By devoting resources uh, today for more production today, we have more output in the future <clears throat> and also uh, longer lines of production. So I ask you to uh, compare uh, this line of production to this line of production, washing clothes with a washboard versus washing clothes with one of these uh, new high-tech uh, washing machines that's connected to your smartphone. 
<clears throat> you might think just on the face of it that this is a longer line of production because it takes longer to wash clothes with a washboard. But actually, if you consider the entire production process, this one on the right is the longer, uh, has the longer production time. Because you have to take into account all of the work, all of the uh, production that had to go into producing the smartphone, producing the technology to connect the smartphone to the washing machine, and also, by the way, to uh, construct the washing machine. So more capital intensive pr uh, lines of production <coughs> have a longer production time. So this is why we know that this relationship exists. One more example here. Imagine this production process picking cotton by hand versus this production process, having this big tractor thing pick all the cotton for you. This one <coughs> here is the longer production process because you have to consider the construction of this big machine. Also worth noting, uh, this, this line of production could only happen if we have a bunch of saving ahead of time. So we have to save to construct this capital. And in the process, we decrease the interest rate, which makes this line of production uh, profitable in, in so doing. <coughs> All right, so now to uh, switch gears here. So that's, those are the effects of an increase in savings. We can talk about what would happen if we have an increase in fake savings. So we've already seen how central banks can increase uh, the supply of money. And if that increase in the supply of money happens in systems like we have today with fractional reserve uh, banking, with fiat money, and the, those fractionally, uh, those banks that are holding reserves uh, in fractions are also financial intermediaries, then new money created in the economy enters in through credit markets. So the new money that is printed up and distributed, doesn't, it's not tossed out of a helicopter, it's not given to angels to, to distribute to everybody evenly, it's, it's, it's funneled through credit markets. And we'll see that this is the crucial feature here, this is the crucial causal, uh, or first cause of what uh, causes the Austrian business cycle story. So central bank can expand credit without an economy-wide increase in savings. So independent of what uh, time, preference, time preferences are, they can make it look like there's more savings available by increasing the supply of loanable funds. <coughs> so um, the result of this is that the interest rate falls, but again, it's not because of a decrease in time preference. At the lower interest rate, actually saving decreases. So we haven't changed time preference, and now all, all you're saying is that uh, the returns to lending are lower. People are going to save less. They're going to be lending less on that, on that uh, loan market, which means that consumption will increase. So before we had uh, an increase in savings that resulted in a decrease in the interest rate, this time we have a decrease in the interest rate that results in more consumption. So totally opposite uh, directions here. Also, borrowing increases at this lower interest rate. And in fact, a lot of borrowing would occur just to finance the increased uh, consumption. This is what we see uh, in business cycles. <clears throat> so it's not just consumers borrowing th those new funds. It's also firms take the new funds to increase their uh, production. So they invest in new and longer lines of production. But remember that this increase in uh, production, and the new longer lines of production, were not dictated by consumer demand. It was based on, on the whims or the, or the, uh, the ideas of the uh, people making monetary policy, not based on consumer demand and consumer or society-wide uh, time preferences. The result of this is that factor prices are bid up across the board. So we have a general increase in the cost of production, as we'll see. Whereas before there was a restructuring of where resources are allocated, here uh, money is flowing everywhere. So uh, fact, the demand for factors increases, therefore factor prices are bid up, wages increase, employment increases, consumption increases, and investment spending uh, also increases. So this may sound bad the way I'm describing it, it's because I'm here, the Ludwig von Mises Institute, but actually this feels good. Right, this is the boom period. Wages are increasing, people are consuming a lot, people are investing a lot. You see a bunch of new projects springing up. This feels good for people that are involved. It's, it's what happens later on uh, that hurts, that's the, the painful part. And so we would, generalize, we would call this the uh, general boom. All of these increases because of the artificial credit expansion is the boom. <clears throat> 
so the, the clincher is that consumers did not show that they preferred uh, future output to present output. In fact, they decreased their saving at the, at the lower interest rate. There were other mechanisms at play here, and these are widely cited in the literature. Uh, Dr. Englehart, who presented earlier, uh, has this idea that entrepreneurial quality also decreases. So the good entrepreneurs leave and bad entrepreneurs enter the market. <clears throat> Since the credit expansion uh, does not represent an increase in real resources available for consumption or investment, all these new projects can't be sustained. So we haven't actually increased the amounts of resources available in the economy. All of these new lines of production that entrepreneurs uh, undertake can't be completed because we haven't increased the amount of resources in the economy. In fact, the amount of resources are being dwindled down as people increase consumption. So we have a decrease in the available resources for both consumption and investment when we're trying to increase both at the same time. And so factors of production become increasingly scarce. Their prices uh, are driven up uh, astronomically. <clears throat> and it's higher than entrepreneurs expected. And so all of those anticipated profits that they thought that they were get, going to get uh, at the outset, when they started this new line of production, turn into losses. And so this, as we can already see, explains the cluster of entrepreneurial errors in the uh, business cycle. So entrepreneurs are led to believe consumers had saved real resources, uh, or consumers had saved and that real resources were available production, and also that the longer production processes would be profitable. All right, so just to give you some pictures here, so before we had the pictures of uh, savings, Instead of having projects like this, you know, sort of a modest house that a, that a consumer can afford, instead of having off regular office buildings, by the way, I think this is actually from uh, uh, the office, so this is the Dunder Mifflin site here. <coughs> and, and I couldn't find a good image of this, but instead of uh, students uh, leaving school at some point and getting a job, uh, we see these sorts of things. We see large mansions being built, and instead of modest, um, office buildings being built, we see these extravagant high-tech skyscrapers. And we see uh, students uh, taking on more and more loans to stay in school as, as credit is cheaper. So these, this, this would be indicative of artificial credit expansion. I should mention that these things by themselves are not bad. It's, so whether or not you think mansions are bad or not is a separate question. Skyscrapers are, are fine, you know. Uh, staying in school is, is good too. <clears throat> but what makes these malinvestments is that they were encouraged by artificially low interest rates. It's not profitable to engage in these sorts of uh, lines of production yet or at that time. So this is, this is the key distinction. <clears throat> so the result is depression. All these malinvestments have to be liquidated. We have to have uh, a restructuring of the way uh, resources are allocated. We have to have a restructuring of prices. So firms attempt to liquidate malinvested capital. They try to uh, make the best of a bad situation. So they sell off factors of production. They, they sell off their, what output they had started to make at lower prices. Wages decrease and workers are laid off. So we, this is where we see the increase in unemployment during the bust phase. Credit markets dry up, it becomes harder to borrow. <clears throat> Prices readjust to reflect consumer demands, which is what we wanted all along. And this happens to both inputs and outputs, as you heard from uh, one of the previous lectures about imputation theories. So the, the price of the outputs change based on consumer preferences, meaning the inputs that go into producing those outputs uh, also have uh, decreasing prices or changing prices. And what's uh, critical to note here is that the depression is the recovery phase. This is where things go uh, where they should. So before things were going where they shouldn't, prices were skyrocketing when they shouldn't have. The depression is where we have all the corrections. This is the market trying to uh, get resources into profitable uh, uh, lines of production getting uh, consumers into homes that they can afford and, and this sort of thing. So the depression, <clears throat> the depression should not be avoided. We shouldn't try to engage in government policy to avoid the depression. The depression should be embraced to an extent that we need to go through this recovery phase to, uh, uh, to get back on our feet. And so just in summary, I can contrast this uh, to uh, an alternative theory uh, quickly, but just to summarize, the shape of the uh, business cycle for Austrians is, th is that it's a boom and then a bust, uh, and it's caused by expansionary monetary policy, which triggers malinvestments on the part of uh, entrepreneurs. <clears throat> the cure is to allow markets to liquidate those malinvestments and to correct all the problems that the expansionary monetary policy caused in the first place. And 
I can restate this cure j just to make the distinction between the Austrian theory and the Keynesian theory more clear. It, what this means is letting consumer demand dictate uh, prices and resource allocation as opposed to monetary policy makers or as opposed to the government. And to prevent this sort of thing from happening, just don't let, let, let non-market institutions into the money production business. Let money production be uh, done by the market so that there are these natural uh, stoppers, natural limits, as Malavika um, noted in her lecture. <clears throat> for Keynesians, the shape is different. The shape for a business cycle is, is that it's a bust and then a boom. And the bust sort of comes out of nowhere. They say that the cause is this inherent instability in investment spending. Keynes used the term animal spirits. They're just going every which way, and investors don't really know what's going on, and sometimes they all make errors at the same time. <clears throat> so I said that the bust sort of comes out of nowhere. It's because that this cause doesn't really explain things. They have to explain first why is investment spending uh, unstable, and why is it stable sometimes, we see, and unstable at other times. Another common cause that you'll hear is that it's a fall in aggregate demand, also associated with the decrease in investment spending, <clears throat> which is totally different from the Austrian approach. Uh, the cure for Keynesians is actually the cause for Austrians. So for Keynesians, they would like to address this depression phase, this bust phase, by engaging in more expansionary monetary policy, by doing the same things that got us in the mess in the first place, and also expansionary fiscal policy. So uh, make work projects, you know, uh, it's, a ton of government spending to get people employed. <clears throat> we can restate the Keynesian cure here is let the government dictate uh, uh, prices and resource allocation. And prevention for them is the opposite for Austrians as well. It's to give the government control of money production and a blank check for spending. <clears throat> so in conclusion, uh, the Austrian theory really does the best at explaining the phenomenon in, that we see in business cycles. Uh, we can successfully explain business cycles using this malinvestment concept. So malinvestment is investment in unprofitable lines of production induced by artificially low interest rates. <clears throat> by using this key here, this malinvestment concept, we've explained all the things that we set out to explain at the beginning. So it explains the shape of the cycle, the boom and then the bust. It explains the cluster of entrepreneurial errors. It explains the more dramatic fluctuations in capital goods industries compared to consumer goods industries. And it, it was related to our original suspect areas, money and uh, credit. So thank you very much.